It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out, when by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful! Great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness. But these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set. His shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The beauty of the dream vanished, and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Unable to endure the aspect of the being I had created, I rushed out of my room. Welcome to The Subverse. I'm your host, Susan Matthew. This is a podcast where we journey from the cosmic to the quantum, from the complexity of development to the art of resistance, from colonial histories that haunt us to reimagining futures. In the opening to this episode, you heard a short excerpt from Frankenstein, the novel written by Mary Shelley. The voiceover was by Ambrina Rao, a talented actor based in New York. Frankenstein is a big favorite of mine, a book that kept me company at nighttime in a shared dorm I stayed in, in my early teens in Bangalore, India. Such a layered story of horror, death and grief, with themes of gender, technology, science weaved throughout the book. This book never gets old for me. In this episode, I was so grateful and excited to have the opportunity to discuss Frankenstein with Professor Robert Romanishan, whose work I serendipitously discovered during the COVID lockdown in 2020. Having had a fascination for Carl Jung, I found a website called the Jung Platform where courses were offered. In the mix, I found an incredible course called The Frankenstein Prophecies, led by Professor Romanishan. And this introduced me to his remarkable life's work in this area, and specifically on this book. Robert Romanishan is an emeritus professor of psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute, and an author of eight books, including Victor Frankenstein, The Monster and the Shadows of Technology, The Frankenstein Prophecies, which was the focus of our discussion. His special area of concern is the psychology of technology, especially in terms of climate crises and the impacts of digital media on our social structures. In his book, he asks eight questions that uncover how Mary Shelley's classic work haunts our world. He combines Jungian theory, literary criticism and mythology to explore answers to the query at the heart of this book. Who is the monster? In the first six questions, Romanishan explores how Victor's story and the monster's tale linger as the dark side of Frankenstein's quest to create a new species that would bless him as its creator. Victor and the monster are present in the guises of climate crises, the loss of place in digital space, and the eclipse of the biological body in genetic and computer technologies that are redefining what it means to be human. In the book's final two questions, Romanishan uncovers some seeds of hope in Mary Shelley's work and explores how the monster's tale reframes her story as a love story. In keeping with the theme of fire in this podcast season, we zoomed in on the fire-related metaphors in Frankenstein exemplified in the subtitle, The Modern Prometheus, alluding to the Greek fire myth. Fire is lightning that struck down a tree early in the book, the use of electricity and galvanism, the digging up of the dead in cemeteries and in charnel houses, death in moonlight, 
the monster running away to the Arctic North, promising to burn in a pyre there after Victor Frankenstein's death. Robert Ruminishan makes pertinent and astonishingly prophetic allusions to our digging up of fossil fuels, the melting of the poles, and the dying of nature. And we end with a different kind of fire in our conversation. Not everything is a burning down. In the email setting up the call, he wrote, As a witness to wonder, another kind of fire displays itself in the splendor of the simple, the extraordinary in the ordinary, the miracle in the mundane, and even when the gods are love, a glimpse of the sacred and holy presence of creation. That fire is the living spirit of Natura Naturans, the Anima Mundi. Unfortunately, Robert had a terrible accident in France where he lives shortly after we had our conversation and from what I understand is in a long recovery period. All we can do is wish him all the best in this recovery. May it be speedy and complete. He is writing a beautiful book that he spoke about at the end of this conversation and so I do fervently hope he can get back to this as soon as is possible so he can share his poetic wisdom and grace with us all. Robert, welcome to the Subverse. It's so nice of you to join us. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much, Susan, for the invitation. Looking forward to the conversation. I'm so excited that we're going to be talking about the book Frankenstein because it's one of my favorites from the time that I was a child. And I was so fortunate to come across your work on it. And uh, it has it has really been so revelatory and life-changing for me. So thank you so much. You're quite welcome. It's always nice to hear that your work has had some measure of uh, acceptance. Thank you. So let's get started with the interview. And I wanted to start with my first question, which is, that of all the major symbols in literature, art, and religion, perhaps no symbol is more ambiguous and double-edged than fire. In Greek myth in particular, the symbolism of fire is bound up with the myth of Prometheus, the story which explains how humankind came into possession of fire. How does fire, through the modern Promethean theme in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, reveal itself in the book and in your own work on it? Okay, excellent beginning question. Mary Shelley's story, Frankenstein, is a not only pivotal novel, um, but it's prophetic. Because when she writes it and publishes it uh, in 1816, sometimes it's seen as 1818, what she shows us is that the protagonist, Victor Frankenstein, is a modern Prometheus because in the title of her book, she doesn't make it an analogy. She identifies Victor Frankenstein with Prometheus. So in the myth of Prometheus, we have the story of how Prometheus transcended the boundaries between humans and the gods and stole fire as a gift to humankind, which is, in, in terms of the myth of it, it is what makes us human, the ability to make and to control fire. But in the story of Prometheus, he lives in a sacred cosmos, and so he has to pay a price of crossing the boundaries between humans and the divine. When Mary Shelley tells the story of Victor Frankenstein, identifying him with Prometheus, he doesn't just cross the boundaries between humans and the divine, he erases it. He becomes the new God of creation. He replaces the Christian God. And he sees himself then as a new creator God as one who would bring a different kind of gift to humankind. He will erase the stain of death. And with that in mind, he begins to live out the story of Prometheus. But unlike Prometheus, who suffers and 
must pay the price because of what he's done. The gods exact their price. Victor Frankenstein has erased that boundary, and it's all the people around him who pay the price. He's going to erase death, but he brings death to all of his loved ones. So the very thing that he wants to do, erase death, now comes back to haunt him. And in the process, what he does to to show how he can erase that is he creates a being, and that's the so-called monster. But we'll come back to that, because what I want to emphasize here is that in the myth of Prometheus, the story is that his brother, Prometheus's brother, Epimetheus, uh, wants to marry Pandora. Prometheus says, that's probably not a good idea. But be really careful about accepting a wedding gift from the gods. And of course, Epimetheus marries Pandora, and uh, Zeus gives a gift, the jar. And in that story, when uh, she has the jar and she opens it, she unleashes all of the evils in the world, sickness, death, famine, plague, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, as we call them. And it seems to be that that's the price paid for not heeding the story about not being careful about getting a gift from the gods when you're not supposed to be doing what you're doing at the wedding, getting married, a prohibition. But in the story of Prometheus, there's always this other sometimes piece of it that is left off. And that is, after she opens the jar, or whatever the vessel is, but it's a contained vessel, and all the evils are unleashed, there's one gift that remains, hiding, tucked away in the corner, the gift of hope, the gift of hope. And so the story of Prometheus is really about a gift, about a gift of hope when, as human beings, we do challenge the gods, the boundaries, etc. So it, it's a story that balances both what it means to be human and challenging things that are larger than us, or than the gods here, uh, the balance between that and going forth with that, but finding hope. And that, I think, is the beautiful part of the story about Prometheus, that it is also a story of hope. Thank you so much, Robert. And I think a lot of us, we see the story and the penance or the price that Prometheus then pays and how fire is unleashed on the world. But we often forget Pandora. And of course, the names themselves, Prometheus is foresight and uh, his brother is, is hindsight. And we often forget that hindsight is also part of the story. That is true. Their names are really important. Foresight and hindsight and Pandora herself, are they, the all-giver, uh, the, all the gift. Yeah. Robert, if we could speak a little bit more about fire in the book, because when Victor Frankenstein, what starts off his journey into or his descent into madness, so to speak, is when there's this tree which is struck by lightning. And so that's probably the first maybe image of fire in the book. And then there are various other points in the book where it also appears more as light, solar light versus moonlight, and, and a few other allusions that you have made. If you could speak to us a little bit about that. When Mary Shelley is writing the novel and publishing it the early part on well, the second decade of the 19th century, there's a whole series of experiments going on with galvanism and using electricity to sort of animate, you know, make frog legs jump and stuff like that. And there's even a story about how when a man who had been hung, when they applied electricity, he raised his arm and his eyes opened. So they thought, my God, electricity really is what 
is the principle of life. So all of that is going on. In fact, Mary Shelley's uh, story, Percy Bysshe Shelley, experimented with that. In the book, then, uh, Mary Shelley tells the story about how Victor Frankenstein, as a child, witnessed lightning from the sky blasting a tree and destroying it, killing it. And that impressed him as a little boy. Imagine if he's eight, what that would mean, you know. And, and he begins to understand that lightning, the fire from the sky, Zeus's lightning bolt, the fire of the gods, that this power of lightning and fire might also be able to produce life and not just destroy things. So he begins to investigate using the principles of galvanism, etc. And he's convinced that, that he will be able to create life by using the creative force of fire. And so the novel goes on from there. I love that scene where you speak about when he when he creates the monster's mate and he suddenly sees what he creates in moonlight. Yeah. You see, I've read Mary Shelley's story really so carefully because it's filled with I read I read it as a Jungian psychologist. So I'm always looking at the symbolism, the archetypal meanings, etc. And when he agrees to create a mate, which in itself is perhaps maybe the most poignant part of the story, because, uh, you know, in the way the book is written, it, it's in separate parts. And Mary Shelley always begins with a quote from John Milton's Paradise Lost, that I solicit thee, maker, to draw me from my clay and create me. So th there's a pathos and in, in the monster the so-called monster that's an important question i think we got it backwards who is the monster but there's a pathos let's call him the creature has no name has no history imagine that and in his pathos and his loneliness he says to victor he says even adam had his eve make me a creature like myself Hideous as me, scarred as me, and I swear to you that we will go to the farthest reaches of the earth and never populate it. And Victor first says no, because he's afraid, you know, my God, I'll unleash a race of devils. Because by this time, the creature has sacrificed, killed many of those that Victor Frankenstein loves. Uh, people around him have died, including his father. But finally, the monster's loneliness gets to him. So he says, yes, I agree. I will make you a mate. Now, remember, he created the creature using solar light, the light of the sun, electricity. So he goes to his laboratory in Scotland. And there he begins to fashion the mate for the creature, the second act of creation. And there's that poignant scene when the monster peering in through the window, at that moment, as the moonlight is shining through the window on Victor Frankenstein, the laboratory, and the mate lying on the table. And the monster watches when Victor Frankenstein, horrified, Oh my God, what am I doing? I'm doing the very thing that I should not have done in the beginning. He realizes that there's only two times that I could find in the book where he has some sense that maybe for him to act as if he was God, that was a transgression. And that's one moment. So he hesitates and then he tears out of pieces. And at that moment, in Moonlight, the second creation, the feminine, the mate for 
the creature that he has made. He rips her to pieces and throws her into the deep waters of a cold, dark Scottish lake. Now, in that part of the story, what Mary Shelley is prophetically telling us is about the death of the feminine and the way in which modern science and technology in its shadow side has been the death of nature, the feminine. And where is she now? She's buried in the deep waters of a Scottish lake. Will she rise again? Now we see how the prophetic story comes, when I wrote uh, Victor Frankenstein, The Shadows of Technology, one of the questions is the return of the feminine. But what Mary Shelley saw was the, what I call the spectator mind, who stands apart from nature and dominates it as if he were the god, that the shadow of that spectator mind, which goes back to the technology book, is the death of the feminine, the death of nature. And that's what the story prints out. So the question that rises is then, when the monster sees that, he he takes his revenge out of a sense of despair. And that's when all of the murders begin then. And so uh, it follows on that. And the ones who die significantly, not just Victor Frankenstein in the end, or his father, but Elizabeth Lavenza, his bride-to-be, the monster in, in revenge, in despair, murders the bride-to-be, Elizabeth Lavenza. And one of the housekeepers who was supposed to keep an eye on Victor Frankenstein's brother, the monster accidentally, it seems, kills William. And the housekeeper is blamed. And even though Victor Frankenstein knows it was the creature who did it, he lets her go to her death. So there's all of this dying along the way of, of the feminine. That's a key point. We'll be back after a break. So in Frankenstein, there are allusions to fire and ice. You spoke about how the monster said that he would disappear into the furthest reaches. At the end of the book, he goes into the poles. That's where the story sort of ends. And you have spoken and written about how that alludes to the melting of polar ice, nature having a meltdown. You also speak of your own trips to the poles. Here, I also want to bring up the digging up of fossil fuels. Because in the book, there are the scenes where Victor Frankenstein digs up the dead. If you could speak more about these aspects of the book. That's where I think the prophetic aspect of Mary Shelley's story comes true. How this becomes prophetic is the way the themes of fire and ice begin to get played out as the story progresses. When all of the destruction has taken place, Victor Frankenstein, after all the deaths have come, knows that he must now kill the monster. Okay, And again, still, we have to ask who is the monster. So he pursues the creature, and uh, he, he finds a ship that takes him up to the Arctic regions, the land of ice. And it's interesting that at that time, too, there was a lot of exploration that was beginning about the polar regions of the world that was that was really coming into being and would really consume the end of the 19th and beginning part of the 20th century. So he boards passage on the ship, and that's how the story takes place. It's he tells his story to the captain who writes letters to his sister back home. But he tells that story as he is dying to the captain of the ship that's taking him. And then they spot the creature. And so Victor Frankenstein insists that he now be allowed to pursue. So he's racing on the ice, trying to catch up with the creature to kill him. And 
he fails and he goes back to his cabin exhausted and as he's lying in his cabin near death having told his story to captain walton the captain of the ship one night the creature steals back into the cabin and it's beautiful because the creature asks one thing from victor frankenstein's creator who has abandoned him to acknowledge him to see who he is to perhaps we could even say uh recognize that he is the son of uh victor frankenstein but he also is asking for forgiveness for what has happened but um victor frankenstein dies before any of that can take place so he leaves the ship in a terrible kind of sense of rage and despair and he starts to travel on the ice and he says that i will go to the farthest reaches that i can find and there i will set fire to myself immolate myself so that no trace of what i was in the story that made me will ever be found and that's where mary shelley's story ends but we don't know if he did that and that was the symbolic moment for me where i could raise the question did the monster die or in so far as mary shelley is prophetic is he still living if he set fire to himself is the fire still burning is the melting polar ice the warming of all the seas the heating of the planet all of the crises that we find today the fires that consumed over a billion animals i think it was in the australia deluge a couple of years ago the burning of the forest in california is that still the fire that the monster created when he immolated himself does he live now in the symptoms of the melting polar ice and all of the ecological crises that we face today so that's i think for me the telling part of the story that mary shelley's story goes on the monster whether he died or not symbolically the consequences he lives on in the way in which the fire is still burning and the fire that is cooking the planet not just our food but cooking the planet now you ask the second question about fossil fuels that's another way in which the legacy the continuation of the creature whom i prefer to call that rather than the monster the creature with no name no history no mate whether this whole question of how this continuation goes on in terms of the way in which now we use the fire of those who have died all of the animals and the creatures dig them up like victor went into the charnel house and used the dead to create life the digging up of fossil fuels now is that we are building a culture a technological culture resting on the dead building up the fossil fuels or, or heating our our civilization with the fire of the dead using the fossil fuels that we find it's i think it's it's a continuing expression of mary shelley's uh, vision that this part of the story becomes played out now and how what victor frankenstein did in his charnel house is using the dead to create life we're doing the same thing we're living on the energy of the dead that have been buried in the earth and through eons and eons uh, have turned to the minerals that we use the carbon the fossil fuels that uh and the methane gas that escapes from our burnings we're still doing what uh 
what Victor Frankenstein did. And how long is that sustainable? Now we see that the burning of those fossil fuels, like Victor Frankenstein used the dead to create life, that using the, the fossil fuels that we now use to create our energy, our fires, our, they're not creating life. They are killing us. They are cooking the planet. And, uh, you know, we're almost reaching a tipping point because we are polluting the atmosphere with carbon. And once we pass a certain point, there are things that might become irreversible. And we're fast approaching that point. So that's that would be my response to what you asked me about fossil fuels. So, Robert, I wanted to also ask, because you, you did mention who is the monster, and uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more on that particular subject, because you speak about it so beautifully in your book. Thank you. Well, we tend to think in terms of uh, a split between Victor Frankenstein, who we then regard as a pathetic creature, and he really meant well. So, you know, he's... He's the guy with the white hat. He's the good guy. And the monster who wreaks all of that havoc, he's the bad one. And even in the films, you know, the early films, like with Boris Karloff, uh, the monster is just the, the negative one. But I, I think psychologically we have to flip those roles because if we think psychologically, when Victor Frankenstein sees what he has done, Despite his good intentions, his first expression is horror. Why? Because the creature does not live up to his ideal of beauty. So he runs away, abandons what he has done, does not take responsibility for his actions, and then he falls into a deep sleep and is horrified because in a deep sleep he goes to embrace oh, his mother, and she turns to him and she's a rotting corpse. So now he knows that what he has done perhaps should not have been done, but he takes responsibility a little bit for himself once or twice, but now his mission becomes, I've got to kill the very thing I made, the raging, crazy monster. But the fact of the matter is that Victor Frankenstein, if you think about it psychologically, has denied within himself, so these are psychological dynamics, if we see something out in the world that disturbs us, displeases us, we always have to look for ourselves because what we do then is we deny it as part of ourselves and we project it onto the other and make them the enemy. We are the victims then, and that's what Victor Frankenstein does. He doesn't look at the shadow side of himself, the shadow of the spectator mind. And he blames the creature for everything and abandons him. When in point of fact, the creature, the so-called monster, is the one who has been created by Victor Frankenstein out of his own hubris, like in a Greek tragedy. It's denial within and projection outside. So in this way, we have to look at, reverse the, the terms and see that Victor Frankenstein, using those primitive psychological mechanisms of denial and projection, he's the monster, and the monster himself is the carrier made into the victim of what Victor Frankenstein denies and has denied in himself. We see that happening all the time. Look at how many times we create scapegoats fake news, uh, religious divisions, people who are different from us then become the enemy because we cannot tolerate something that we don't like in ourselves. The monster is not the enemy. We have to see how Victor Frankenstein, through his denial of responsibility and projecting it all onto the monster, it's his fault, etc., that we have to look at. We have to see this speck in our own eye. We need a new kind of consciousness so that we don't keep blaming it. Oh, it's, it's this group. It's the, the scientists. It's the, uh, politicians. It's not economically feasible to change things. 
when all of these problems really start with us. We can't keep projecting. Yes, the, the destruction of the environment is a scientific problem. Yes, it's an economic issue. Yes, it's a political issue. But nothing is going to change. We're going to tinker with it on the edges, and we see that's happening until we realize that the problem lies within us. It is a psychological problem. Thank you so much, Robert. And I'm so happy that that's come through in our conversation today, that this is a deeply psychological problem. And here it leads me to my next question, which is, I think, it gives us a chance to speak about your present book and your work. So my question is, again, coming back to fire, is fire also a signifier of hope, not just of burning down? Can we bring back Pandora into this Promethean tale, along with other powerful feminine or feminist myths? And when we first exchanged emails, you wrote that there is another kind of fire. And I gather that, that this is now being worked on and maybe in the writing of your present book. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about this. I could not have left all of my half century of work on technology, uh, the technology book and then the Frankenstein book, which diagnosed the problem, which told the story in a dramatic way from Mary Shelley's point of view. There has to be some in the dark corner of the jaw, what is the hope that is still there? And uh, I have been working on what I have called an unplanned trilogy, and the third book is a book of hope. So how does that begin? It begins with, I think, in part, maybe, you know, we think we're directors of our life, but maybe being here in France, I could say the reasons why that happened in large measure, because my wife loves France, and so I'm here because I'm with a woman who is my beloved. But at the same time, I've grown to, to a different place because we live in, in this house which is surrounded by all of this greenery and the song of birds and the shaft of sunlight as it makes its way through the trees, the dance, the rhythm, the play, like an erotic embrace between the wind and the bushes and the trees. All of that opens up to me that there is, there is a spirit working its way through nature and we have lived for so long in a culture that reduces everything to matter and has forgotten the living spirit, the anima mundi, which brings life. And like spirit has a certain kind of animating force. And as spirit, I equate that with a kind of the, the living spirit as a kind of fire itself that's right there. If you have eyes to see, and if you're not too much in a hurry to quickly pass by. So in this book that I'm working on, the third part of the Unplanned Trilogy, it is a book of hope. And I have to use a different format for that book. It's a simple book, stories of my wandering in wonder and witnessing now and then the splendor of the simple the miracle in the mundane, the extraordinary in the ordinary moment. If you just sort of shift your consciousness for a minute and let yourself wonder, to let go, to suspend for a minute everything we know about nature and let it impregnate us, speak to us. And that's like becoming a child again. So the, the book is a series of my wanderings in wonder as a witness to the miracle in the mundane and all of that. I'll give you just one example, if I may, so it's not so abstract. The other morning, I'm sitting, because uh, my wife has been away for about three weeks. I had a lot of time where I'm just kind of in a meditative state. And I start the day in my garden. 
And we've got beautiful landscape gardens here. I count, count this as very privileged. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm sitting there drinking my coffee, and all of a sudden, I hear the rhythmic song of this bird in the garden. And I let it penetrate it, me. I let it come in. I wrote a little poem about this. And I suddenly then realized that it's rhythmic cadence. When it inspires me, something aspires to be said about that. And so I just take the repetition of that bird and its song, and it sounds like the bird is singing and asking a question. What day is this? What day is this? What day is this? I'm impregnated with that. And then another bird at the other end of the valley seems to answer. And again, it's the rhythm that impregnates me. And I hear the rhythm. And then as if I have to give voice to that, the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And I wondered then, you know, I'm not a poet, but I have a poetic sensibility. I'm not claiming anything more than being responsive to how the rhythms of nature ask us to give them expression. That shaft of sunlight suddenly highlighted the living spirit of nature. And you know, children still have that because before they say anything, and sometimes it happens to us, that living fiery spirit where nature is itself miraculous. And as William Blake said, all the world is holy. The child knows that because before he's the master of language, he'll see something and he'll point his finger. If that living fiery spirit raises the arm and draws out as our response, it's as if we are here to give voice to the flesh of the world because we are also flesh. It's like a love affair now between the sensual hunger of our bodies and the sensuous magnificence of the world. It's just dripping with eroticism. And what do you do as lovers? You speak the language of love. And that's what that book is trying to do. Robert, it's absolutely beautiful. Just cannot wait to read this book. And I do hope that you will come and share more of the vignettes with us when it's done. It's really been an honor speaking with you. And I hope that we will continue to be in touch because we'd love for you to also come back and do other projects with us on our website. It would be a real honor. I would be pleased to do that. You know, I turned down a lot of invitations now to husband my energy, but I was, when I looked at your site, I would say yes to you. And uh, there's one other person that I never turned down. So yes, I'd be happy to. Thanks to Robert Ramanishan for sharing his thoughts with us. And thanks to Ambarina Rao for the voiceover at the start. The Subverse is the podcast of Dark and Light, a digital space that chronicles the times we live in and reimagines futures with a focus on science, nature, social justice and culture. You can follow us on Instagram at Dark and Light Zine. If you like the show, please tell a friend and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. The Subverse is produced for us by Waka Media. So long. And thanks for listening.